much fun. <laughs> well, I do think we can probably start and then see when uh, others join uh, according to their own timelines. So thank you very, very much once again, everyone, for joining. I know this is August is, of course, the month of holidays in the Baltics, the last uh, warm moments of the summer um, are there to enjoy. Um, but I also wanted to say that, uh, and I was speaking to Natalia earlier, that this is indeed a very cheerful moment for all the project participants, as this, uh, this project has been ongoing since 2019. And, uh, and therefore, uh, I welcome you to this actually very, very important event to us, and definitely to uh, perception studies as such in the Baltic states, as I believe there haven't been so many before. So this Jean Monnet project um, that Natalia, um, who is the brain behind the project, is going to give you a run through a little bit later, um, is, indeed, um, uh, is, is indeed approaching the end of its journey. There are a couple of project uh, partners and colleagues that have joined us here that are presenting Lithuanian and Estonian perspectives. Um, however, I wanted to say that uh, the sort of Latvian intellectual powerhouse Vineta, who has indeed been driving this project, unfortunately is not joining us today because she's taking a well-deserved holiday. I also wanted to give uh, a very cordial um, hello to Jana, who is not here today, Jana Sabatovic. She has also been a very, very close colleague in the realization of this project and has been helping us uh, to really understand what is at the core of youth opinions you know, and sort of opportunities for EU public diplomacy in Latvia. Regardless of all the people who are not joining, I will be representing Team Latvia today. And I am, my name is Elisabeth, and I'm associate at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs and also a researcher at the PPMI in Lithuania. And um, I would like to uh, then underline, and in fact, Pass the floor to Natalia, uh, without whom we would not have been able to be a part of this project. Natalia Chaban is from the Public Diplomacy and Political Communications Forum at the University of Canterbury, and she is highly renowned for perception studies, in fact. So um, the honor is ours, and the floor is yours, Natalia. Um, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you very much, dear audience, for coming on Friday morning on summer Friday morning to this seminar. Elisabetta is very kind. And I just wanted to say uh, our team is a fantastic team. And it's my privilege to work with incredibly talented people. And um, Elisabetta and Vineta, I'm so grateful for organizing the event, but also um, for being ready to organize it face to face a year ago. We were supposed to meet in April 2020 in Riga and have a big public event. Everything was organized. The hotels were booked. And um, we didn't come because of the pandemic. And um, we have here today with us uh, uh, Gintra Shumskas, Shumskas, who is from Lithuania, and Vlad Vernihora, who is from Tallinn. And um, they are our researchers. So hopefully, um, if there are any questions, and Vlad and Gintra, you're feeling that you also would like to step in and say something, that would be great. So we have representatives of three Baltic states here with us. And um, I'm grateful for your support, but also for your incredible dedication to this project. And thank you again to the audience for coming today. I thought I will start very briefly, just with a little bit of a context about who we are, what we're doing, and um, just for you to understand where this research is coming from. So it's a Jean Monnet project. So it's supported by the European Commission, Erasmus Plus, Jean Monnet program within it. And it's a transnational research project. It unites people from University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. We are the leading organization together with um, colleagues from Lithuania. We have two organizations from Kaunas and from Vilnius, from Ukraine, obviously from um, Latvia, from Ireland, from London, from Tallinn. So we are very privileged that even though we're not maybe facing each other in our meetings and research, we're still in touch with each other and we keep producing some, I think, interesting outputs. And hopefully you will be interested in learning more uh, about this project and its outcomes. And please ask me questions and plus 
uh, all of us were here to answer your questions after we present some of the key findings. Just a little bit of illustrations, just to show you that we're very serious. We have our trainings. We had fantastic meetings in Ukraine and Lithuania. So Riga was next and it didn't happen. And, and it's, a, it's a great team of uh, people who are who will be working together even after that. So it's a little bit of just an illustration of who we are and how many of us. It's a sizable team. One of the main concepts that guides our project is a concept of a strategic narrative. Strategic narrative, it's a um, theoretical explanation of the soft power in the 21st century, in the century of internet, in the century of um, kind of um, information traveling freely between national borders, no more frames belong to national systems, media frames, and um, uh, soft power became really power of a story. The so strategic narrative concept was proposed by members of our team, Alistair Miskimmon, Ben Laughlin, and their colleague, Laura Rosell. And um, so we're quite lucky to have them on our team in general. And it's about a team to give determined meaning to past, present, and future in order to achieve political objective. And so we're interested about narratives which are projected by our uh, state uh, actors about Europe, about the Baltic states, about individual Baltic states, about Ukraine, about their interactions with each other, about Russia. And um, we are interested in um, um, seeing how these narratives are communicated. So it's not only the formulation, but it's the communication of those narratives, but it's also about the reception of those narratives. And it's perhaps one of our uh, contributions to the scientific discussion. It's about how people receive these narratives. And in our focus are young people, uh, future voters or current voters, people who are what we call young elites. These are people who are under 33 years old and they are already in some key positions in policy making, in decision making, in opinion making. Um, and they are already making history and future for their country. But they're still in the beginning of the way to, to, to future glory. So we are interested in those who will then set the tone uh, in the years to come. We're also interested in those who will come uh, into universities. In our focus, students of the universities, but also students in high schools. The project itself uh, has three constituent parts. That's what we've done. We wanted to see about which, which narratives are presented to the audiences and which which other sort of in the public domain so we looked in the popular e uh, publications so these are e electronic platforms of news which are read by millions of people they're very popular in the respective locations so we have three baltic states in ukraine and these are the ones which are popular among the younger uh, m younger cohorts of uh, local populations. So these are the narratives projected. And we studied a reception uh, among those who I call decision and policy makers, multipliers, influences, movers and shakers. We also call them sometimes young elites. Elite is not, we're not using it in a negative way. We're using it just to show that these are the people in sort of control position in making policies, decisions, opinions. And we looked into this, we did surveys and we did focus groups with university students and high school students. And so today we're going to present some key findings. So we have lots of findings. We already have two special issues and more publications will come. So it's impossible to talk about everything, but hopefully you'll find something interesting. Well, I suppose I'll give the floor to Elizabeth after I introduced our project. So wonderful. Thank you very much, Natalia. Indeed, um, so today's uh, report from Team Latvia is going to be based primarily on the interview component of the research, as well as the article that we wrote. And I want to take the opportunity and also to promote the special issue of New Zealand Slavonic Journal that is uh, shortly going to come out. Uh, and we are also going to be doing uh, the advertising on the uh, website of the Latvian Institute of International Affairs. So you are all very, very welcome to check it out um, very shortly. Uh, so one of the uh, components of the uh, project, um, of the Jamonet project, uh, was the media monitoring that we did. 
And um, the article that we wrote was in particular interested in the concept of strategic alignment. Natalia already spoke about the strategic narratives. And we were interested in which way the uh, national, the most popular national news outlets align or in fact uh, not align with the official narratives of the state. Therefore, we re reviewed 73 articles in the most popular news outlets, namely Delphi, Tevenet, and LSM uh, in the Latvian language. And this should be noted also as a slight limitation to uh, our research because we did not look at the Russian speaking uh, news outlets in Latvia. And uh, we, in fact, were uh, trying to see how in the articles where both Russia and Ukraine and some kind of relationship between those countries is detected, uh, depicts uh, these countries. Uh, to put it simply, the official narrative of the Latvian government is that Russia is the confrontational force to the West and that, in fact, it continues to be contrary to the principles of international law. Uh, whereas Latvia is a country that embodies the West, the Western uh, ideas, the democratic and liberal values, and it is a strong adherent to the Western world. And Ukraine is a country which shares the history with Latvia, and therefore Latvia is somewhat responsible for supporting the um, strives of this country to adhere to the Euro-Atlantic community of values and eventually at some point the European Union. It is important to note that these uh, strategic narratives of the Latvian government have proven to be important on an identity level of the Latvian population too. So in fact, the belonging to the Western world is a very, very important part uh, of uh, the self conceptualization of the Latvian society. Um, this also means that the events that took place in Ukraine uh, were actually perceived very seriously by the Latvian society post Maidan, and this also uh, stroke at the core of the security perception of Latvia because of the security related dynamics that were seen in Ukraine. In fact, Ukraine was somewhat perceived as a brother in pain. And here, Natalia, I would like you like to ask you to switch the slide. Um, in fact, what I wanted to show uh, or tell about is that the understanding or self understanding of the Latvian youth is very much alike. Um, when we are looking at the strategic narratives. Um, in the interviews that we asked, uh, and what we asked to the Latvian youth elite, um, their understanding of, for instance, the role of the Baltic states vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. And some of the answers were indeed highly interesting. For instance, in the context, for instance, when asking what do you think the role of the Baltic states vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine should be, uh, the answer was the following. In the context of the European Union with Ukraine, our role must be at least to help to bridge the awareness of what it means to be a state, uh, to be a state in the in such a development stage. I often see Ukraine as similar to Latvia in the 90s. The transformation there was a little bit slower after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Baltic states could be a bridge to such awareness rising, consequently helping to understand what aid is best and what form aid, or what form of aid is necessary. So indeed the strategic narrative of the state that says that Ukraine is a brother in pain and we understand how to help it better is also reiterated by the youth elites. Another question that we asked in the interviews was how do you describe the relationship of the European, with the European Union with Ukraine? And the answer was as follows. Ukraine is a pretty, pretty strategically important country at this stage. It's a country that is between Europe and Russia, a very large country, and it is essential to maintain its sphere, its, uh, its sphere of influence and to try to bring it closer to a more developed European model of democracy. Another question that we asked is what role should Latvia play in international relations? And here the answer was as follows. Well, I think that Latvia is a bridge between the East and the West, but we need to be very Western. I'm all about it. We should show to the East that we need to make diplomacy, that we are one of the rare countries that speaks to you and you want to, and, and we want to leave it that way because you need us and we need you. I think it is not a bad position to be in because we have good, good qualities from both sides. Um, so I think that there is indeed a certain convergence on the strategic narratives level that is very, very pertinent to the Latvian case. With this in mind, uh, I would like to move uh, to the actual core of our uh, article. 
So um, when we were looking at the 73 articles that I mentioned, um, there is indeed a certain uh, re-emergence of the narrative of the Guerre Froide or the Cold War, where there is indeed a great com com confrontation between great powers in the context of Upra Ukraine, namely Russia and the West. However, uh, as the analysis revealed a, ver revealed a very straightforward good versus bad depiction is only characteristical when the media in Latvia speaks about uh, Russia and the West. Natalia, if I could please ask you to switch between the slides. Uh, as you see here, uh, we looked at in particular the thematic framing or the different topics that the Latvian media talks about uh, when it speaks about Russia and when it speaks about Ukraine. And here you can really see that the depiction of Russia is predominantly negative, therefore it's not even broken down in more detail, whereas the depiction of Ukraine is much more nuanced. And this indeed is a very, very important finding too, because whereas the strategic narrative of Latvia towards Ukraine is typically very supporting that is to say that uh, Ukraine is a country which adheres to the Western values and therefore it should be supported as much as possible so it would eventually make its ascension to the Euro-Atlantic uh, to the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, it is not as straightforward when it actually comes to the media narratives. Uh, the media narratives actually break down uh, the events uh, in Ukraine um, and speak more of the corruption and the general mismanagement of the state that are in fact seen as, as very important uh, factors hampering the possible adherence of Ukraine to the Europe Atlantic community of values and eventually also the European Union and NATO. Natalia, if I could please ask you to switch to the next slide. Um, this is in fact um, very much reiterated by the youth uh, that we were talking to, to the youth elites um, that we were talking to in the interviews. What do, we, what do we actually see in these interviews? Uh, when asked what are the main conditions for Ukraine to enter the EU, immediately the answer follows. Changing the ideological values of society and the corruption, those are the main ones uh, that were reiterated a couple of times in the interviews. Um, but there was also another interesting dimension that appeared in the interviews that wasn't spoken so much uh, about in the actual uh, news narratives. Uh, when answering the question, would it be possible for Ukraine to join the European Union, the youth said the following, well, I think it is possible, yes, why not? Of course, there is also a problem that the bigger, that is a bigger house and that it needs longer to be fixed or and the filth store is in, in it too. But at the same time, it is not unimaginable because the aspiration is already in the political environment and also in the society. I think it has to be possible at some point, simply because how long can they wait? And I would say that in general, um, the findings that we have from the Lat Team Latvia's uh, perspective mean many things. Firstly, that the Latvian media is indeed an agent that conveys the information to the general public, and it plays a very, very crucial role in the legitimization of the official narratives of the state. At the same time, as we also saw that not uh, that the Latvian media does not agree with the strategic narrative of the Latvian states on all levels, uh, there is space for alternative uh, narratives um, that can emerge when it comes to Ukraine. This is indeed a hampering factor for the prospects of the uh, Ukrainian government and the Ukraine country as such. Um, so the overall, I would say that um, as a result of uh, this project, um, there has been indeed a, a big contribution to the sort of the, the understanding of how the general youth perceptions in Latvia uh, see and understand the strategic narratives of the state. Um, however, I think after this more practical and applied um, applied example, if there are no immediate questions, we can switch back to Natalia introducing the bigger picture of the project. Thank you, Elisabetta. So we will proceed with presentations, right? And then if people have questions, we'll collect all the questions at the end. Excellent. Precisely. Well, if, if there is a consensus about this, uh, I will talk about two dimensions. The first dimension, I will try to compare Latvian perspective to the Lithuanian and Estonian 
having Ginteras and Vlad in the audience will definitely help me. They will correct me if it's not um, that way. This is based on the article, which is about to be, which is already published with Demokratizatsia. And this is a journal of Eastern European studies published in George Washington University is one of our special issues. And on this case, I've been working together with uh, two members of Team New Zealand, Professor Donald Matheson and Professor Linda Jean Kennex, who are my co-authors of this particular article. And um, uh, with, um, it's my pleasure to New Zealand to you. So um, I, I think I will start with um, a different concept. It's a concept of liminal Europeanness. And actually, I came to know about this project from the work of people who are academics in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And um, I'm sure you've heard about this uh, concept. If not, in, in a nutshell, it, liminal means in the process of becoming, but never becoming. So it's kind of always becoming. And um, your um, uh, academics are actually arguing that one of the legacies of European enlightenment of the 18th century is actually um, a very conventional vision of Europe, of West and East. Uh, people like Voltaire, who's never been to the East of Berlin, actually invented something called Eastern Europe. And everybody seems to know this is Eastern Europe. But where is the border? How is different? We all know that these imaginary borders they do have real uh, life political consequences. And so the academia in the Baltic states discusses this concept of liminal Europeanness and says that Central and Eastern European post-communist countries are sort of Europe, but not Europe, always ever becoming European. And the Baltic states and this vision are very reliable, uh, but they're sort of a periphery of the European uh, this is again, this is academic research. There is sort of a core, and then there is this sort of uh, periphery. And um, there's always this trying to become the core. And so that concept really captured our attention. And we wanted to see um, sort of, um, is this is, is this is the way how, um, how if we look at Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia reflecting on Europe, is uh, this is sort of, how what guides the perceptions of Ukraine. And we wanted to look into the media storylines and we wanted to look at the perceptions of multipliers and influences. Again, these um, meanings which already exist in public agenda, they're already forming agenda of the public. And also these are the meanings that have potential to shape the public agenda. Uh, we are scholars of media and communication, and um, in our quest, we wanted to see if um, media frames uh, behave somehow differently in this particular region or overall. One of the bigger assumptions which guided our investigation that media frames do not move in national system exclusively or linearly. And if we think about media in three Baltic states, it's Western liberal media environments. In this situation, we have many different sources informing about what's happening in the region and the world in the country. Some of them are national, some of them are regional, some of them are international. It's a pragmatic decision of a particular news outlet, which news sources to use. And that's why the information is really tangled. There's many different voices. The narratives in media are not told by just one voice. There are many different voices. And we wanted to test, is there is something called a regional pattern of meanings and interpretations of, of Ukraine, of Ukraine's path to Europe, of Ukraine's relationships with um, each uh, Baltic state. And um, we wanted to see, are these narratives of very nation specific, or is there actually some sort of a shared pattern in meaning formation? That's sort of our interpretation. And um, yeah, um, we are again, as media study scholars, we wanted uh, to look at through the prism of the so-called third level agenda setting theory. And the idea is that there is the meanings in the media exist in some sort of a bigger network. And then in our mind, meanings are also existing in networks. And we want to see how these meanings come together like a puzzle. Do they correlate? how meanings come together in media and how they come in the reception of media 
messages. So it's quite an interesting new iteration of the agenda setting theory. And I, I, I suppose that's what we wanted to test. Again, to remind, um, this is the model which looks into sort of open uh, Western liberal type media environments, which are relatively open to different uh, sources of news. So a big research question where, so what, what are the storylines which come about uh, Ukraine in the Baltic news media? Are they country specific? Are there, region, are there any regional storylines? Do meanings conveyed by the media storylines convey the opinions of young multipliers and influences? And what do resonances and clash, clashes mean um, to politics, to diplomacy? Uh, and to the strategic narrative on the identity level of these countries. So these are kind of our... Um, since one of my backgrounds is political communication, again, as researchers, we're looking at several theoretical models. What are theories? Theories are explanations. We treat information we gather in terms of um, what we call uh, uh, po political psychology. Every image has a cognitive part of it. Every image has some, a little bit, carries some emotion, and it also may carry a normative evaluation. So that's what we evaluate in our analysis, cognitive, emotive, and normative. Then um, we're looking at the frames, and we want to see what is visible, what is visible in the media, what has a local hook, and what has an emotive charge to it. Because if a foreign actor introduced a lot, and if the foreign actor has a local hook to your location and there is some sort of emotion, you will notice that actor, you will care because the message from media, if it's reported, it must be important. If it's reported a lot, then it's indeed important. If it connects to my country, then it definitely touches my heart and my, my, my me. And finally, emotion, emotion representation raises the reaction, because if it's neutral, it, people may not react as much. And finally, we want to see, so what is emerging? What sort of stories then emerge from this framing? Is Ukraine presented as a powerful and a capable actor? Or is Ukraine, not all, is Ukraine presented as sort of pre opportunity or maybe a threat for a Baltic state? And finally, what's sort about the status? Is Ukraine presented as inferior or superior? This is coming from image theory of international relations. And so these, these are all conceptual elements, which hopefully uh, now when I presented them will make sense when I present the findings. Um, we've just heard from Elisabetta about a Latvia's sample. Now, if you compare this to other countries, you can see that um, Latvia is second. So we observed only one month and that one month coincided with some dramatic events in Ukraine. I'm, I hope you remember the Azov Sea uh, incident, the, the seizure of the Ukrainian Navy ship, the capturing of the um, sailors, Ukrainian sailors, and the international community uh, was really discussing this particular event. So it was, if you wish, the hot topic. And you would expect there will be potentially a lot of Ukraine in, 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 because it is a security incident and it is quite an unusual incident. You can see how Estonia presented a bigger sample. Latvia was second in coverage and Lithuania was uh, the third in its volume. But then you can look in terms of intensity of representation. How much of, the, of those stories really talked about Ukraine as the major focus? And you can see if you start looking that way, even though Lithuania was a smaller sample, Lithuania actually decided, or Lithuanian media decided to focus on Ukraine in the main way, in a very major way. While Latvia and Estonia um, um, split and lots of articles actually mentioned Ukraine just in passing in a very minor way. Lithuania was also a country which presented more reports where Lithuania and Ukraine had uh, something together. They were doing things together. The other two countries presented a lot about sort of Ukraine doing something in Ukraine rather than doing something together with Latvia or Estonia. In our elite interview sample we had uh, in this article, we're looking into 17 interviews, specifically people who are what we would call opinion formers, media professionals, so social civil society people. They are active in different platforms and they're influencing opinions. Overall, we interviewed 30 people in three countries. We wanted to know about 
how do they learn about Ukraine, what sort of perceptions about their country relationship with Ukraine, Ukraine's relations with the EU, and aspirations to come into the EU and role and future of the EU in the Baltic states and regional European and global leadership. If you look at the media storyline, so after all that analysis with all those theories that informed our, uh, we found out an interesting picture. So we uh, here looking into the big thematic lines. Uh, politics, economy, and social affairs. What we found out that in each big thematic line, the meanings were splitting almost in exact polar images. For example, uh, the first storyline, Ukraine and external affairs, was about Ukraine-Russian conflict. And in this one, Ukraine's capability was seen as weak because Ukraine obviously was attacked. In this situation, it was seen as a threat to Baltic, but if you see, there is affinity because the Baltic states also feel a threat from Russia. So on this grounds, there is affinity. Ukraine is like us. The second storyline, it's about Ukraine's democratization, reforms, as such growing capability. It is an opportunity for the Baltic states in all three. And like us, the reforms are happening there too. But the third storyline would be about the corruption. It's exactly what Elizabeth just mentioned. It's about sort of political regime, which has internal problems, very much linked to the rule of law corruption. As such, it weakens Ukraine. It is a definite threat to the Baltic states. And the, and the state is affinity is not like us. We've done it. We've, so the, it's, it's lower. The same in the economy. On the one hand, Ukraine has troubles with its economy. It's weak. Again, corruption is mentioned no opportunity, not like us. But on other, in the other set, Ukraine has actually lots of business opportunities for Baltic states. There is a potential opportunity that the reports about all sorts of interaction, business interactions, and it is like us. And finally, in social affairs, a, a big chunk of articles talked about Ukrainian labor migrants and um, the situation. So um, on one hand, it's sort of a weaker economic performance, but there is an opportunity for Baltic states, not like us, lower. And finally, Ukrainian social affairs, where Ukrainian individuals were sort of very talented uh, cultural individuals, some creatives, um, IT people. Here, it's capable Ukrainian, Ukrainian image. Uh, there is an opportunity for Baltics and like us, or even better. So you see that for each line, there is a split into something Ukraine weak, Ukraine strong, Ukraine opportunity, Ukraine is a threat, like us, not like us. That's very unusual when you have um, such a sort of um, divided portrayal. You would think after the 30 years of Ukraine's independence, the image will be much more solidified, but it's not what we are observing. What about the young uh, uh, multipliers and influences? Those are who are people uh, who we mentioned. Well, um, for the first kind of our um, so we were thinking that one of the main important points is that Ukraine's, the references to Ukraine will be seen as sort of references um, that Baltic states are no longer liminal, that they are already in the core, that they are not becoming, but they are European. And that's exactly what we found out in our uh, uh, re interview replies, that young leaders, they already see the Baltic states are already European, they're EU-focused, Euro-enthusiastic, with European values, and very self-positive, self-opinion, self-vision was very positive. The cognitive element about Ukraine was, first of all, in three countries, the meanings were shared. Ukraine had similar historical trauma that Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania had as such, that painful experience, and Elizabeth also talked about it. Because of that, Baltic states understand what happens in Ukraine better than other EU countries, and that's where they should help. That makes the Baltic states already in the core of Europe because they have some unique expertise, and because of that, they can tell other European member states what, what is going on in the region, how to understand, how to relate. And they, this expertise already is making them very important in the community. So not liminal, already in the core. Normative element, Ukraine, in the opinion of our young multipliers and influences, seen as definitely post-Soviet with different values in all three countries. Um, and as such, it's, it, it is different. Again, one more time, confirmation that it's not be that the three Baltic states are not becoming, but they are European. 
and there are mixed emotive elements. For example, Ukraine is seen to be revising its normative foundation. Democracy was recognized as, as a very positive element, but still lagging and embracing European values. So one more time, the Baltic states in comparison are seen much ahead um, of the game. And so in this situation, ref Ukraine as a reference definitely moves our younger audiences towards that sort of uh, we are in a Europe. So it is actually liminal Ukraine and Estonia, Latvia and Sia can relate to this. It's Ukraine who is, if you wish, moving from the east to the west. And is such in three different countries in the Baltic states, we see exactly the same regional strategy, how they are reshaping their identity and using Ukraine as a reference. But when I talk about regional strategy, it doesn't contradict the fact that actually there are these very strong national identity country brands coming through our study of perceptions. Uh, what we found out at Latvian and Lithuanian interviews, they are more inclined to see Ukraine as promising and intriguing, uh, more opportunities, for example, and uh, using the script as friend and brother. While Estonian respondents, uh, they're much more willing to talk about lagging economy and sort of that pragmatic image of kind of Ukraine as a friend, but when it comes to business, it's not just friendship, there are pragmatic moments. So we see a little bit of a difference. There is also difference when our respondents react to the theme of Ukrainian labor migrants. In Estonian case, we, he we hear more sort of normative concern. These people are coming with different norms, while in Lithuanian reflections is more about unfair treatment of Ukrainian migrant labor force. Um, Latvian reflections were very muted, not much of reflections on the Ukrainian labor migrants. So, which brings us to these kind of nation-specific nation images. Um, in this situation, Estonians reflect on themselves when they think about Ukraine and relations with Ukraine, that we are the model uh, for other post-Soviet states, including Ukraine, and sort of we worked hard to achieve what we've achieved, and so Ukraine needs to do it yourself, like Estonia did. Latvian respondents actually uh, very much stressing the image of sort of Latvia looking forward moving forward. And um, it was interesting that Elizabeth picked up the quotes, which are very specific to Latvia. Other locations did not use it. It's the bridge. It's the bridge between West and the East, and sort of transition between Eastern and Northern Europe. So Latvia sees itself a little bit like a buffer country between two normative poles, and it relates to Ukraine on this particular geopolitical sort of grounds. Well, Lithuanian respondents, it's about brave Ukraine. So they're talking about brave Ukraine, and Ukraine is not afraid to stand up to a major aggressor, but it's in very much in parallel to how Lithuania sees itself, because it's a small but brave country who's very outspoken in the European Union, in the world. And um, yeah, and it's interesting that reflections on the risks of European integration process um, and something which, so we have these very specific national themes, which are very different but how the meanings came together and using Ukraine as a reference is very much the same. Well, these are lots of conclusions. I suppose I may, I'm aware of time. That's why I might, I've, I'm pretty much mentioned all of the conclusions. Uh, it's just, uh, I, it's just, just to reiterate, but I'm, I, I really want to tell you how Ukrainians see the Baltic states. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I have maybe five minutes for that, Elizabeth, if it's okay, because I really want to hear the questions. Yeah. In this situation, I am looking at another article which comes in Demokratizatsia, but also I will talk, um, I'll mention some research by my colleague Jana Sabatovich, who is not able to join us today. So in this particular situation, we are looking into three, so the same idea, we're looking at media, we're looking at elites. And in this particular article, we looked not only at the representations of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonian in Ukraine, but we actually looked at the metaphorical representation together with my co-author, Viktor Vilivchenko, also of the University of Canterbury, also in the special issue. So um, you can see that in Ukraine, in the same period of observation as we observed the, the, the Baltic states, in the same period of observation, Lithuania captures more attention than other Baltic states. And then we have uh, other states. Uh, the first 
level of key uh, research, uh, key search words where Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and then if in those reports we had Russia, European Union, Ukraine, we would analyze that too. But if you look how they were metaphorized, you can see that though, although Lithuania was a lot in Ukrainian media, not a lot of metaphors came, but Russia, even though it wasn't the leading um, reference, definitely attracted a lot of metaphors. And we know that people use metaphors in their speech or written language when they either feel emotional or they don't understand the, 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 the phenomenon very well. So uh, metaphors and specifically conceptual metaphors and metaphoric scenario, they guided our analysis in order to understand what is the image of the role Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia and the European Union play in the narrative uh, of Ukraine's integration. So uh, Ukrainian media definitely stresses the theme of the Baltic states as friendly allies to Ukraine. The most reported is Lithuanian and the image of Lithuania also like in Lithuanian, there was lots of link with Ukraine. Here we also see lots of links. It's not just Lithuania doing something in Lithuania, but Lithuania with Ukraine. Also Lithuania was presented as the most vocal act out of the three Baltic states. Um, Ukrainian media doesn't like to use the Baltic states. It prefers to use individual countries, probably like something happening in, in, in the region too. People like to call them their countries rather than just the generic Baltic states. And uh, media stresses the image of the Baltic states for freedom, democracy, in contrast to Russia. We compared metaphors used in the media on the left and then we also interviewed our elites and they had more diverse metaphors. They were much more opinionated and used quite a colorful language. While um, metaphors used to describe um, uh, actors in, in media were a little bit more sort of, uh, there is uh, something, um, this is a bit of a continuum. Lithuania is uh, portrayed with the most of positive metaphors in terms of an ally, but also as a friend and friend who is fighting for you, friendly, brave, strong voiced actor. Estonia was presented as a strong ally, quite principled and resilient. That's where the metaphors used, while Latvia was uh, presented as um, also in need of protection and um, kind of looking into team effort, looking at actors with whom Latvia could coordinate. So every state could sort of an ally, but on a continuum of readiness to jump and help Ukraine. What about young elites? All of them saw the Baltic states standing together with Ukraine. But what is interesting, elites, you also saw image which did not appear in media. And this is an image of the Baltic states as model or teacher for Ukraine in terms of uh, resilience, in terms of reforms, in terms of transition from um, the kind of sort of post-Soviet transition. And particularly Estonia emerges an example to kind of follow as a model. What about the European Union? For um, elites, it is seen as a destination. So Europe is a destination. Ukraine is moving towards it. It is also seen as a protector. So Europe defends Ukraine against aggressor personification metaphors of partner and ally. And this is where negativity comes through. Sometimes EU was described in positive terms and sometimes as indecisive partner. And finally, as a power, on the one hand, again, positive, can protect, but on the other side, has its own internal problems as such weak, weakening and contested. Um, yeah, and um, I suppose I may probably stop here, right? because I think we would like to have more questions rather than us talking. So I will potentially stop sharing. I just wanted to tell you that we have more and Jana's article is next, but uh, let's maybe talk a little bit more and have the questions, because it's really interesting to hear your opinions uh, and reactions to our findings. Yes, please go ahead. If you have some questions, you can safely unmute yourself. Uh... Or if not, maybe our uh, Lithuanian or Estonian colleagues have some reflections.
I'll just probably uh, say a couple of words. Uh, um, this is uh, has been a, an excellent academic initiative, quite frankly. Uh, it, uh, uh, the first thing is that the findings uh, were published, uh, but, well, there's probably a lot more data than uh, than for the two special issues that uh, that are coming through, uh, and it's uh, also quite impressive because the uh, the idea to study uh, within this framework actually touched, uh, you know, nearly everything that the academic research uh, can have. Uh, firstly we were engaging our students to monitor uh, uh, media sources in the proper way. We were teaching them how to uh, uh, get the needed data. Basically every single media source, uh, the person who was reading that source had to answer quite a high number of questions. Uh, and this is how the data came through. Then we had this queue sort testing of the uh, of the strategic narratives which we could gather from uh, from every single side uh, and then of course the interviews with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, young elites so uh, it's from those three angles uh, I think uh, the story that uh, I mean the, the from the academic point of view the story that uh, the team, was able to gather, uh, 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 it, it is quite compelling and, uh, and the findings are very, very solid. In this respect, I, I would probably uh, uh, maybe ask a, a small question, you know, how, apart from those two special issues, how, how uh, uh, probably this, this question is to, uh, uh, to Natalia, uh, how would you like to proceed maybe in terms of maybe presenting this on a, on a, on a higher level in terms of policy shaping or, uh, or how to deliver this message? So this message will probably shape some existing strategic narratives uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, I mean, the new team uh, in Ukraine is trying to kind of manage the country the way they they are trying to do, uh, and, uh, as well as in uh, uh, in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, uh, people would probably like to find out this in a in a uh, maybe in a less complicated way, in a less academically complicated way, but how can we make up a good summary out of this to present this to the uh, political elite? Um, thank you, Vlad. Uh, you are absolutely right. The um, kind of the so what and who cares? These are the big uh, important questions every research project should answer. Well, when we were coming into this uh, project, we obviously thought that whatever we find out will be communicated to the people, to people who are engaged in dialogue with Ukraine, in uh, on the European side, on, on, on the side of the Baltic states, because, um, now let's be honest, this year we're celebrating 30 years after collapse of the Soviet Union, right? So this year we are, uh, there's already generation of people born and already active politically and professionally. They've never experienced um, joint education system. They're not watching the same movies. They're not reading the same books. Um, the references which potentially existed for all the generations to bring them together are um, gradually disappearing. Why would a, um, a young person in Latvia look closely into Ukraine for opportunities, I mean, studies, travel, whatever, if let's say let, no, there is very many people looking to, to the West and um, there are more references, English as lingua franca nowadays. So we, we're seeing that the, with the change of elites and generational change, when people who are now 50 and 60 will start retiring and people who are now 30 and 40, 30 and 25 will come start coming in there will be a big change in paradigm because this is a completely different way of connecting 
And um, that's one of our findings. We do find out that there is a growing gap between younger generation looking, let's say, towards Ukraine. Yes, it does fall. The younger generation seems to follow the narrative. But we, what we find out is a little bit more. And it's that growing feeling. I wouldn't say detachment, but it's more of indifference. And what we found out was our elite interviews uh, that many people after the elite interviews were saying, actually never been to Ukraine. I actually been there, but many years ago, after this interview, actually, I would like to go to Ukraine. So I, what I didn't present today, on the Ukrainian side, we see through the surveys that younger generation students and school children don't know much about um, uh, the Baltic states. The associations are beautiful sea country and the capital very sort of tourism stuff rather than values or political and this is a concern because it means that the younger generation seems to be drifting apart and i think policymakers need to know about it so the project finishes on the 31st of august its official timeline finishes on the 31st of august but it will not be finished and i hope when COVID is over and I could come to Europe again because New Zealand remains close to the world at the moment. Um, we could organize events for specifically political people who deal with youth and youth dialogue and, and tell them about this. So it's a long answer, but I hope it's something you, you, you probably thought about, but we all thought about it last time we met. So, yeah, yes, because... Uh... Uh, and it, it would be good to, to really arrange, uh, I mean, it's from the Estonian side, uh, there is a strong uh, connection, for example, that the, uh, uh, the committee, uh, Ukraine-Estonia at the Rigi Kogo, at the parliament, uh, that is uh, really, really strong in working constantly on communication with the Ukrainian side and probably the other way around goes in the same way. Uh, and plus, of course, everything is backed up by the fact that uh, we got uh, from, uh, especially from the survey answers, uh, uh, not probably, I mean, in my case, in the Estonian case, it's probably not uh, necessarily all the time from the interviews, but from the survey, uh, it was the most impressive segment for me because uh, the, generation of people who had no idea about the Soviet Union, unlike myself, uh, had an association in the context of Ukraine uh, in, a, in a very diverse and a very sophisticated way. So I, I could not believe that I, that I was uh, reading that how many people actually associate Ukraine with as diverse uh, questions as the Holodomor, for example, and uh, and some cuisine and maybe even traveling and and uh, the uh, very different nature so it's a it's a mixture it's a such a such a nuanced mixture of everything so it was not one-sided that okay porsche whatever uh, but it, it was a lot more in depth so in this respect this is the difference between the ukrainian side as you are uh, saying that that the, the Ukrainian youth is a lot less, or they have a lot less in-depth knowledge of what really Estonia or Lithuania means. So for example, you can, you can have Lithuania as a warrior as is usually presented in, in, in uh, uh, Ukrainian media. So it's a, it's a knight, knight that always stands up, no fear, no nothing really kind of stands up and says what it, what it needs to say, uh, uh, but there is no kind of depth to that, which is a bit sad. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, since we're already talking, since we are here and uh, people are talking about that, I just wanted to share with you the wor word clouds when the students were asked, what are the three images, come to, what three images come to your mind when you hear the words Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia. So they were all asked for each state. And you can see on the screen that for Latvia, for example, but for all of them, the very strong association was the capital. You see Vilnius, Riga and Tallinn. But also what is interesting that it's a country which seems to be so like, 
Sure, it's a country, but the fact that it's a sovereign country, I think it's quite important. There's no doubt in in head in the heads of young people that this is not a country. This is it is a country. It has sovereignty. Of course, the sea comes very prominently in, in all responses. But I thought it's an interesting one. If you look, um, it is about Yurmala for Latvia, but it's also about the European Union. EU also comes as a bigger one. And um, I, I think it's it's interesting. If you specifically look at um, Latvia, it's European, it's beautiful, it's brotherly. Um, yeah, I think these are quite... And if you look at the generic association with the Baltic states, you see massively sea, but also modern and beauty and warmth and beautiful and European and similar. So Ukrainian and excitement. These are very positive uh, associations. I suppose I'm showing in to show that the Ukrainian youth has a potential, has a very positive opinion. And it's an opportunity for the Baltic states to secure this young generation as people who like you. <laughs> then they already like you, then do things with them. Um, it's good to have a big country like an ally. And so this might be another message to the politicians. Indeed, if I, I may perhaps add that uh, I think the particularity uh, that I noticed uh, in the Latin component was there is a very there's a perceived understanding that the information that the youth elites and also in the survey that the people have about Ukraine, in fact, I think it is indeed a perceived understanding rather than substantiated by actual knowledge. But it, regardless of that, even the mythology creates a certain sense of kinship. And this is something indeed that should be also capitalized upon in a sense, you know, by, by not only promoting the results of this research, but also something to, as a note for, for the Ukrainian policymakers, in fact. And also uh, in the word cloud, I think it's a very interesting uh, thing to say that Lima Vaikule is something uh, which is seen as an association with Latvia. I wouldn't say that in Latvia anybody would say, you know, that Lima Vaikule is something, but apparently we just don't know. Huh? So. And um, I suppose another thing is that uh, the world of COVID really, really hit on this sort of exchanges, cultural exchanges, personal exchanges. Um, the world will change and the young generation, especially those ones who were in the beginning of the education or professional career, this, this gap will be felt. People will be affected. They, younger generation, I'm, I hope, I talked to my students about it, that the world will, will be seen as a big mean world, which potentially could hurt you. And it's, um, yeah, um, uh, it's that opportunity of the world, um, which potentially COVID is a little bit damaged. Uh, and I think there, will, there should be more research about the impact of that sort of two year <sighs> cap <laughs> and feeling threatened by an by a virus, but it's it's about international outlook, and it's something to keep in mind too, absolutely. But um, to be in a more pragmatic note, we know from our previous research how the Baltic states um, did not come the part of the Normandy format. We know there are two European Union states, Germany and France, representing by proxy the European Union in the negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. However, we know that it's not going well, right? We know that the war continues. And there was a lot of um, a lot of perception from Ukrainian elite from our previous project, elites on the top level, saying, why didn't they include people who understand us? The Baltic, the Pol you know, Poland, Finnish, Swedish, they, they understand what's going on. And so I think it's another political recommendation. We see lots of kinship, a lot of understanding, and um, that potentially... I mean, if there is already understanding, why not use it in the diplomacy between the European Union and Ukraine? But I think it's already understood because an Estonian at the moment is the head of EU delegation to Ukraine. And I think he's very popular. And the Polish EU head, head of EU delegation was incredibly popular too. So I think there is this um, change in practice. So hopefully we will contribute our findings when the sort of, when travel is more allowed, at least you guys probably in a better position, but New Zealand, you, you can leave New Zealand, you cannot come back because there are no places in quarantine facilities. <laughs> the line is closed till December. But in our and, case, I think uh, uh, personally, for example, I have a physical need to visit Riga at least once a month and, and it's impossible. 
and of course, at least once per six months, there is a need to visit Vilnius. And I really, really miss this kind of stuff. This is, this is not, uh, well, and now I'm, I'm in Baku, that's alarm to everybody. So, uh, it's <laughs> which, uh, which hopefully the pandemic will be over and, and, and projects like this will, uh, will carry on. And I suppose as researchers, and I hope our audience here also, our members of our audience are also involved in some sort of international, transnational research exchanges. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, we, we are affected by, by this sort of, by this, this, and um, we will feel it in the, in, in the years to come because uh, in, in the field of intellectual exchanges, personal face-to-face -face activities are, it, yeah, they're very important, but we're very grateful the technology allows us to connect like this, and I know we're kind of exhausting our audience attention, but maybe somebody would like to ask a question from the audience before we... Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it is one hour of your attention. We have, a, attention. actually, we do have an Anita, would you like to go ahead? Yes. Oh, everyone. Oh, yes, please. Thank you, Anita. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful to hear um, as a young person from Latvia to kind of uh, hear this original research that's being done on, on our perspectives as young people in the Baltics. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my question is maybe about the practicalities of this theme in general. And maybe I could uh, split my question into two parts. The first one would be, uh, I know this is outside of the scope of the research because research is about the attitudes, but I mean, being inside this topic and speaking to people about this topic. Um, so the first question would be maybe to those who conducted the interviews, so Elizabeth or other colleagues, um, what were kind of like the practical things that young people brought up that they're doing, if anyone did, um, to kind of better the relationship or like aid Ukraine or something along those lines. And then maybe for Mesh Chaban, my question would be, um, are you hopeful of positive political perspectives in the future and actual practical implications? Um, or is this just about attitudes? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anette. Um, maybe I will then start from the Latvian perspective and then I can ask uh, my colleagues to jump in. So more on the practical side, um, of course, we interviewed people that uh, could be considered in some way elite, either intellectual or in terms of their cultural capital. Um, I would say those were the two kind of main parts. Uh, we had political activists, actors, uh, even people who already work for the Latvian administration at a very young age. And what we in fact saw was that um, the people who are in culture in particular are capitalizing upon the sense of kinship with the post Soviet states more broadly. And in some of the conversations, uh, the cultural pop potential of the Latvian and, and Ukrainian um, countries and, and indeed societies that stems primarily from the Soviet era, despite the fact that Latvia and Ukraine actually has a much longer history together, uh, was indeed mentioned as a possible factor that could be capitalized upon in the future. Um, there were some small mentions of some collaborations, but in fact, I would say that when it comes to culture, of course, the view is more towards the West, uh, especially for the generation that is uh, just below 30 at this point in time. Uh, when it comes to political activities, there were more mentions of willingness to help and support and participate in different demonstrations. And in fact, uh, this revealed on a very individual level expressing concerns when reading certain news or seeing certain headlines that relate to this domestic politics or security in Ukraine, uh, it, if it in any way, shape or form could uh, affect the Latvian uh, country. Um, therefore, I would say that um, the sort of individual level political engagement, so as I mentioned through different political either demonstrations uh, or just proclamations of support to the country were really, really visible. Um, people also mentioned that they have friends from Ukraine. Um, regardless of that, uh, the communication uh, language uh, was, was uh, there was also mentions of the fact that we speak a common language. 
uh, which is something that can be capitalized, capitalized upon, etc. Um, I also noticed, and Natalia mentioned this, I unfortunately failed, failed to mention this, that um, the business uh, that is in Ukraine and the business potential and the economic potential that Ukraine has as a country was actually mentioned a couple of times. So this is indeed seen as a potential uh, link between Latvia and Ukraine, and also seen as a means to support both countries. So here the feeling is mutual on both sides, and there's an understanding that there is also something that we may take from this country, uh, and it's indeed the vast economic uh, opportunities that it offers. Um, and secondly, hopefulness about the political perspectives. I'm not entirely sure uh, in which way I should uh, phrase it, uh, but I would say that uh, when I look at the youth and the way uh, things are evolving uh, now um, in the Ukrainian politics, I think there is a clear sort of disconnect. There is sort of this sort of more globalized uh, feeling um, of, I would say, indeed, this sort of kinship of the young generation, because even for the Ukrainians now with the liberalized visa regime, I would say more and more of them are coming to Europe. There are more opportunities to mix and to really build networks in myself coming from such a background, I would say that uh, the opportunities are limitless uh, for building stronger ties. Um, uh, before hitting 30, I have acquired a solid friend of Ukrainian friends that welcome me anytime and I do welcome them here. So I think that um, the links now are built on an entirely different level. And as a representative of youth myself, I can attest to this. We never speak of the common past. We rather speak of the common future. Um, I will abstain from commenting on the actual political scenarios. Maybe my colleagues want to do that. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Ginter, as you interviewed Lithuanian elites, maybe you have reflections from Lithuania. Mm -hmm. And we had a big event with your institute. Yes, speaking about the, the uh, elites, probably it's uh, uh, nothing, nothing surprising because many of them uh, actually came from political background. Uh, Actually, some of the interviewees are sitting in the government, in the cabinet right now, so, so we really hit the, the right target, as we can see. So um, I think that that political uh, side, uh, political involvement, it's um, uh, pretty, pretty clear. It reflects that official line. But I would say, I would stress uh, the uh different target groups uh, students and 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 uh, school children the uh, uh, uh graduation uh, students at at, at the uh, 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 high schools and um, I, I remember you just uh, mentioned the differences between the generations and of course it's it's pretty visible uh, our generation and especially uh, let's say my parents generation uh, they have quite uh, different images they have um, you know different common uh, uh, common history of course related to the um, uh, Soviet period and of course young generation is quite different but even if we compare uh, students um, university students and high school students uh, we can see some uh, differences and I think that um, uh, the uh, I would say biggest degree of uh, meeting Ukrainians or so socializing with the Ukrainians actually happens in the universities, uh, because uh, at least in Lithuania we have uh, quite a lot of uh, Ukrainian students, Belarusian students, and uh, I think that it's uh, that place where people meet each other and uh, get um, um, uh, quite quite close, make friends, and um, uh, at least speaking with the students, uh, I just mentioned that uh, actually many of them have uh, personal Ukrainian friends and um, uh, much uh, deeper knowledge connections. Uh, many of them already visited uh, Ukraine, um, uh, at least uh, Lviv, uh, and then of course Kiev, uh, but um, 
uh, school children, I think uh, that um, they're still uh, living in some uh, different closed uh, world and, and have uh, very little knowledge about the Ukraine. But uh, of course, uh, they do read at least news headlines and they, they have a pretty clear uh, picture what's happening. And I actually, I'm quite optimistic about that. Uh, they will join our universities and make uh, quite a good friends with Ukraine. So it's uh, my observation that even in this, uh, let's say, very small age difference, uh, let's say if you are 18 and at um, uh, final year of the school, and uh, if you are, let's say, 19 or 21, you have already uh, quite a different uh, picture of, of Ukraine. And I think it's a good story about the universities because uh, uh, you meet uh, quite um, uh, different uh, people and you get uh, quite different uh, knowledge about, about the country. I will probably say a few words about Estonia very quickly about the interview uh, uh, segment of that because I was doing them. Uh, uh, well, the, thank you, Aneta, for the question. Uh, was uh, what I was surprised when I'm generalizing. It's it's hard to say uh, now uh, in in more details about the ten interviews that we conducted for uh, in Estonia uh, in the elites. Uh, uh, segment. So, but I, my, it's a general, very generalized feeling out of all the interviews that uh, we did is that the young elites, they are not into fake news or kind of fake perceptions or conspiracy theories, kind of, they are not into stupidity uh, that sometimes can. Uh, attract your attention. So they they have a very, very good brain in terms of distinguishing where the, the real world and where the, the, the fake world. So they are they base their analysis on on what is the reality on on, on kind of on on the real world. That's first. And secondly, the, uh, quite often I was surprised how easily they when they are making this connection between the, the region of the Baltic states and Ukraine, how easily they can play with some of the historic events they, they have no idea about. You know, I am in that generation that people in the subway, they, they want to, to offer me a seat. Uh, already, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, probably they see in my eyes that historically for me Brezhnev and Andropov are actually real figures because I have seen them, I have seen them on TV. They, 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 they were alive when I was uh, kind of wandering around. But how easily those elites they can say, oh, we actually have some connections because you know the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I know that this person was born far after the Soviet Union uh, uh, disappeared. Uh, uh, and uh, so they, they kind of have their own interest in reflections on the past. Not necessarily they, uh, uh, you know, these reflections uh, uh, are linked uh, to the absolute understanding of what was going on then. But, but nevertheless, it was, it was a very easy touch uh, with the past. So basically no fakes and the, uh, uh, the very uh, easy way of playing with this historical developments that can be sometimes in, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, can be sometimes used into linking the Baltic states in Ukraine. And um, Anit, if you could repeat your question, because I think I hid it in my mind, but I, I, I've just been so, uh, if, you, if you could just repeat the question to me, that'd be great. Yes, uh, my internet is a little bit on and off, but my question was, uh, how hopeful are you of positive, practical, political Im yep. implementations from this? Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, and it's, no, um, we, we did manage to have one very successful stakeholder public event face-to-face uh, -face in Lithuania that was organized through the Vilnius Institute of Political Analysis and um, our team was on the ground and we had 
um, is a, a, a good group of people, and it was and um, it was intergenerational group. There were people who were uh, not much older. We're talking about those who um, were probably in thirty and forty when the Cold War was in its peak, and people of our age was Vlad <laughs> um, and younger people. And what our project did, well, we presented the findings, of course, we're very proud of our findings, academically, rigorous, methodologically, fine, you know, everything's, but it's that conversation that happened at the table. I, I hope you remember, uh, guys, how there was, we kind of were almost sidelined because suddenly these people of different ages started talking around the table about what we've, what, about our findings. And that was what made me feel very positive because our findings, caused people to start talking about something they didn't talk about. And I still remember a younger person who works in some sort of ministry was saying, of course, we're seeing things like this. And I remember an older person said, but how could you see them like this? They're different. And uh, for me, that was very indicative about that sometimes the conversations are lacking not between the countries, but inside the countries. And um, um, yeah, so that's why um, I am positive about it. Uh, I hope we will continue with this sort of even after the project is finished, but it's how it should be. Project Projects finish, but the network we have, and I'm, I have no doubts that we will continue working in this direction in doing outreach um, to people who are movers and shakers in our societies, respective societies. Um, but I also, I think it links also to the question I, I see in the chat, there is a question um from laura and laura is asking about where you can sort of work and you read about it so we at the moment there are two special issues coming out and one is with uh, democratization and this is the george washington university journal of um, eastern european studies and it literally the first articles are already online the first online but it will be special issue for 2021 and it's the fourth uh, fourth number for the year and New Zealand Journal of Slavic Studies this is the one uh, which um, Elizabeth mentioned it's a second special issue and it looks into country studies in great detail democratization looks more kind of in a comparative looks into other projects but this one looks specifically into this project and it will be available through jstor university libraries if you are really interested just email me elizabeth here's my email but you can google my name and you can see my email at the university of canterbury because if you are interested in our findings and you through your affiliations would like us to come and talk to you or your students or your colleagues we we would be happy to do it zoom you can do anything just just you know time difference sometimes an awkward but even that is not the problem but yeah I, I i personally would be very interested in continuing dialogue because it's about that conversation we're going to have yes indeed, i hope and i answered <laughs> I and, hope and I answered Laura, we are also going to publish the recording of this interview um in, in, in the website of the Latin Institute of International Affairs and also sort of spread the news on all the activities of the article uh, of, of the project. Uh, so thank you very much, I assume. Thank you also, Anette, who got involved from in the audience. By the way, when you speak about movers and shakers, Anette is certainly a future mover and shaker in Latvia. So we also had the honor to meet you. I'm sure that we'll see you in a cabinet or two in the future. Uh, she's already one of these people who are actually making changes from the younger generation. Um, and uh, once again, thank you very much to all my colleagues. Thank you to your respective institutions. And thank you, Natalia, for getting us involved. Uh, we are even over time. So uh, this event indeed has been a true success and hopefully insightful for our audience. Um, and I hope until uh, future uh, collaborations and, and uh, future, future presentations. Thank you, Elisabeth, for organizing. Thank you, Vlad and Ginteras, for coming from, from afar. And uh, many thanks to the audience for staying with us, listening to us. Uh, it's, it matters a lot. Thank you. Indeed. All this. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.